invite you to please stand for When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, hymn number 350. service today on this first Sunday of Lent. Today we do have service of Holy Communion and we celebrate as one and come together as we celebrate participating in the, uh, the celebration of the sacraments together. <clears throat> Some of the announcements that I have, I do want to remind you that there are will be handbells and choir practice March 1st on Wednesday, uh, E-Tri-C-M Workday is on March the 2nd, which is on the Thursday. If you are able to participate in that, please do so, because I know that they can always use the help. Let us now transition our hearts into the prayer concerns that we have, and um, some of the prayer concerns that I have today. Um, I do want to ask that immediately following the worship today, I would like for the elders to come forward and anyone else that would uh, like to, I'd like for us to pray over Jane. Jane will be having her knee surgery done on Tuesday, and so um, I would like for us to lay hands on her and pray for her. Some of the other uh, announcements that we do have, um, want to draw your attention to uh, our prayers for the Spa family and the passing of Adam Spa. He was a former uh, New Hope pastor. And uh, please do remember his family and uh, his wife and all the children. We do uh, pray, continue to pray for Sandy Miller and uh, for Jen Morris. Uh, Sandy is Jen's mother, and uh, anyone of you knows what that is to take, be a caretaker uh, and caregiver for someone uh, that's aging. Uh, it can be quite... Uh, it takes a lot out of you, so please do be praying for her. We do continue to pray for Clyde Allen family and Clyde's passing. We're so glad that Alman and Ann are recovering and back on their feet. And, and Alman's even in the choir today, so he's robed up. So that's a wonderful thing. So good. And we continue to pray for Pam Pavette's family, and Pam's with us today and come to worship with us, and we're so grateful for that. Please do remember Penny and the loss of her son, and we continue to pray for Libby and uh, health issue, issues that she has as she ages, and 
We continue to play, pray for Keith Crow. Keith and Terry are at the beach this weekend. Um, I do uh, want to lift up also Mark's sister, Bonnie Bumburner. Um, she's going to have foot surgery on Thursday. So please do be praying for Bonnie in her surgery. Do we have any other prayer concerns? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I'll have a moment of silence and then I will close our prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, in our time together, we come before you, and Lord, we believe and we pray to you, and we believe that you hear our prayers. And so this morning, we, we lift up our dear sister Jane and her knee surgery. Lord, we lift up her husband Steve as he cares for her in her recovery. Lord, we pray for the spa family in the passing of Adam. Lord, might, that you might be with the parents and be with his wife and children. Lord, we pray and continue to pray for Sandy and for Jen. And we pray for Sharon and Pam and Heather and Penny and Libby and Keith. Lord, we pray for those that have had the devastation and the loss of lives and the loss of, of all of their structures and different things there in Turkey, in Syria. We pray that you will be there with those people, Lord, and that those that are Christians will be able to minister and do their mission work in a greater way there during this time of devastation. Lord, we pray for those people in Ohio in East Palestine, in the railway, the toxic spill. We pray for them. We lift them up to you, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you will make things good for them, send people that might help them. Lord, our needs are many, but you know what our needs are. And so this morning, Lord, we just come before you in all humility, bringing ourselves to you, and giving ourselves to you in our worship time. And Lord, we thank you that we will feel your presence with us during this time. May all that we do in our worship today, may it bring praise and glory to your holy name. For you, Lord, alone are worthy to be praised. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, let us now begin our preparatory to Holy Communion. And if you would please stand, you'll find this as an insert in your bulletin. Attend to the voice of my prayer. But we find forgiveness with you, and we seek to know you and fear you. I pray for the Lord, my soul is faith, and in his 
Beloved, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. We will turn our hearts and our lives, and will turn again to the Lord. God says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. Christ, you who speaks with God the Father on our behalf, our mighty Savior and our glorious King, we humbly bow before you and confess our numerous sins. We, your disciples, have often in word and deed dishonored the holy name we bear and have turned away from your path of holiness and loving service in which you have called us to follow you. Pardon all our forgetfulness of your great love and our coldness of heart, our frequent conformity to the ways of the world, and our failure to strive for the extension of your kingdom. Have mercy upon us according to your loving kindness. Hide your face from our sins and blot out all our transgressions. The assurance of our power, a renewed sense of your holy presence in our lives, greater power to live as you would have us live, and the joyous expectation of eternal life in the heavenly kingdom. tells us, I even I am the one who blots out your sins for my own sake, and I will not remember your transgressions. Go and sin no more. Please sing. <laughs> Thank you. 
As you entered worship, you had the opportunity to give of your tithes and your offerings. Please always remember that it is to God that we give our praises, our prayers, and our gifts. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious and almighty God, you are the giver of all good gifts. Each and everything that we have in our lives, you have given to us, and you have blessed us so abundantly. So, Lord, I pray now that we might give back. Give back just a small portion of what you have given to each one of us. Lord, let us not give out of our scarcity, but let us give out of our abundance. Lord, I pray that you will bless the giver. And Lord, may all that is given be used to grow your kingdom and bear much fruit for your kingdom. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us now transition our hearts into the reading and the hearing of God's holy word. Today our scripture is Genesis 2, 15 through 17, Genesis 3, 1 through 7, Psalms 32, Romans 5, 12 through 19, and the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Hear now the holy word of God. From the Old Testament, Genesis 2, 15 through 17, and Genesis 3, 1 through 7. Moses wrote, The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, You may eat freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, 
except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals in the Lord, that the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not to, allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or t even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt ashamed at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. From the Psalms, Psalm 32. David wrote, Oh, what joy for those who, whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Therefore, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time, that they may not drown in the floodwaters of judgment, for you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. Many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey him. Shout for joy, all you whose hearts are pure. From the New Testament, Romans 5, verses 12 through 19. Paul wrote, When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given, but it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Still, everyone died from the time to, of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not disobey any explicit command of God as Adam did. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's precious gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. And the result of God's gracious gift is, a, is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who, re it will, for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, 
many will be made righteous. In the gospel passage, Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11, Matthew wrote, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For forty days and forty nights he fasted and became very hungry. During that time the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so that you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him, for the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away, and the angels came and took care of Jesus. May God bless the reading of his holy word today, and may he give to each one of us clear understanding. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, on this first Sunday in Lent, we remember the trials and the temptations of your Son, Jesus Christ. We remember his journey through the wilderness and yet how he was victorious over all sin. We pray that our faith may be deepened during this period of Lent. Lord, and that me, we may walk with you in your light. We pray that you will be with us in the challenges that we might face, the temptations that we face in our life. We pray that during this part of our journey that you will be with us and give us the assurance that the challenges of Lent also bring the assurance of Easter. The Easter, the new strength and the new purpose we pray this morning, Lord, that even in our times of temptation, that you will be faithful to us and that you will be with us. And you will help us to remain strong. We pray, Lord, this morning that you might give us ears to hear your truth. Lord, I thank you this morning for my voice. I thank you for the ability that you have given me to be able to speak to your people, to speak your truth. Lord, I pray that you would fill my mouth with your words. I will step aside. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'd like to tell you a little story I've if you feel so led, you might close your eyes. Sometimes you can visualize things a little bit better with your eyes closed. Can you see him, the victim? He's running. He's running with all his might. As he tries to escape, beads of sweat pop out all over his forehead. Each step that he takes is labored. He's exhausted from the struggle. Can you see the fear in his eyes as he looks back over his shoulder? Something's got a hold of him and won't let him go. It's like some invisible force that has attached itself to him and just won't let him go. No matter how hard he fights, it's still there. The relentless enemy keeps preying on him enticing him and drawing him closer and closer. Suddenly, as the victim is reeled in like a fish that has taken the lure, the emotions of shame and disgrace overshadow his emotions. He musters a loud cry. 
Oh, my God. Oh, Lord. Why did I let myself fall into this temptation, an evil trap again? The victim is sorrowful. The victim is heartbroken. And all the angels of heaven begin to weep because yet another earthly soul has fallen again to the prey of Satan's temptation. Temptation causes us much fear and causes us pain. You may open your eyes. William Barclay says temptation is not meant to make us sin. It is meant to enable us to conquer sin. It is not meant to make us bad. It is meant to make us good. It is not meant to weaken us, but it is make us emerge stronger, finer, and purer. Temptation is not the penalty of being a man. Temptation is the glory of being a man. Temptation is a test which comes to every man whom God wishes to use. So then we must think of this whole incident not so much the tempting as the testing of Jesus. Jesus was tested just as we are tested. Every year, this time of the year, the first Sunday in Lent, the story is about Satan tempting Jesus in the wilderness. We hear these stories in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they tell us that the, Jesus endured Satan's temptation for 40 days without eating. Jesus' temptations took place shortly after he was baptized in the Jordan. This baptism of Jesus declared his identity to the world and to Satan and to Satan's demons. For Satan, John's baptism of Jesus painted a bull's eye on Jesus, if you will, and made him Satan's target, just as Adam had been Satan's target after God created man. So immediately after Jesus' baptism, the battle began. I think it's important that we understand that Jesus' baptism puts this bull's eye on Jesus but Jesus' temptation that he endured were very real. This temptation, God with skin was walking upon this earth and he was tempted in every way that we are. He knows how we feel. He knows our temptations. He did not rely on his divine nature. He was fully man, fully human during these times of temptation. It's not ironic that the first temptation comes and Jesus is hungry. We get hungry. Hunger is a characteristic of the human nature. We get hungry, we want to eat. To be without food for 40 days is a long time. I can attest to that other than milk and protein drinks, not to be able to chew. I'm telling you not to have anything for 40 days. Think about that. Jesus did not depend on his divine nature. He depended on the human nature that God had given him. Like Jesus today in our gospel, we do not we're not free from temptation. Temptation is all around us. And Jesus used God's word as a weapon against this temptation. Jesus depended on God through all of his temptations. You know, temptation deceives us. Temptation is enticing. It presents falsehoods. It presents things that are not true. And yet, we can believe it. Because most of the time, it's what we want to believe. We want to. How many times have we said, don't do this, but you go do it anyway? Don't touch this, but you do it anyway. 
Happens all the time with children. Jesus spoke the word against the evil one. God's word is our weapon against the evil one. If we know the word, we speak the word against this evil. When we think about it, you know, unlike us, Jesus never sinned. Think about that. Try as hard as you may want to, we mess up and we sin. We don't want to. Our want to wants to not sin, but we do it anyway. Sometimes it's like when people are, we fall prey to it. It's like hunger. We tell ourselves we're not going to eat that dessert, but then we decide we just got to have it. It's there. We don't want to waste it. We fall prey to the temptation that's in our lives. An 18, a 19th century Scottish author, Sir Walter Scott, said, Oh, what a tangled web, web we weave when first we practice to deceive. We fall into temptation, don't we? And we're enticed by the sin that is around us. And if we aren't careful, our lives can fall like dominoes. Because so many times when you don't pull back from that sin, you sin a little bit, and you decide you'll sin a little bit more, and a little bit more, and before you know it, you're really in deep sin. <clears throat> Excuse me, I use the analogy of the frog in the pot of hot water. You put that frog in that pot of warm water and it's just feeling so good. You keep turning the heat up and before you know it, the frog's cooked. That's the way sin is. Sin can look enticing Sin can almost even feel good, and yet it's wrong. Margaret Thatcher says you have to fight a battle more than once to win it. Sin's like that. Probably not going to just fight it one time or resist it one time. You're going to have to fight it more than one time. Because the Satan knows our weakness, and he's going to go for our weakness. Benjamin Franklin said it's easier to suppress the first desire than to satisfy all that follows. Basically, I would say flee from temptation and don't leave a forwarding address. Flee from it. Don't leave your address. Because you do not want to fall into sin. Because when you fall into sin, you're a Christian. You are a witness for what God has done in your life. And when you go out and you sin, repeatedly sinning, people see this. And it's a bad witness for God's kingdom. If people see you doing things and you're saying, I can't do this because I'm a Christian, they see that. You don't boast about it, but you know that you've done the right thing. When others take things but you refuse to, you're resisting that temptation. A recent survey in Discipleship Journal rated some of the greatest spiritual challenges that we go through as Christians. Number one is materialism. Two is pride. Three is self-centeredness. Four is laziness. Five is anger. Six is bitterness. Seven is sexual lust. Eight is envy. Nine is gluttony. And ten is lying. Surveys respond Respondents that took part in this noted that that was more powerful for them to resist 
sin when they spent time with God. 81% of the people said, when we have spent time with God, we can resist sin. 57% said that when they're physically tired is when they would fall into sin. Resisting temptation was accomplished for many through 84% said through prayer. When they were tempted, they began to pray. They began to talk to God about what they were dealing with, their weakness. They saw the weakness that they had. 76% said that when they prayed, it helped them to not compromise their values, their Christian values. 66% said that when they remained in Bible study, they were less likely to sin. And 52% said that they valued having someone to hold them accountable. That's important. When we have someone that's going to hold us accountable to the things we do, it's much easier to fight the temptation. Husband and wives have that. I know my husband, late husband Jim, oh, if I'd get on a tangent, he'd reel me back in every time. I miss that. It's important that we stay in God's word. We speak God's word. It's important that we have someone that holds us accountable. God's word is our weapon. God's word is how we fight off the temptation. The weapons, the weapons that we have, God's word. The armor in Ephesians 6 also helps us to fight off <coughs> temptation, to fight off the evil one. There's a lot of darkness in the world. I don't know if you haven't noticed it yet, but there's a lot of darkness. And it's easy to fall into that darkness. It doesn't just happen to people that are habitual sinners. It happens to Christians every day. And just as I said in the little story I told you earlier, the angels weep. We have an army of people that are praying for us. They're cheering us on to run the good race, to fight the good fight. So important. Hebrews 4.15 states, This high priest of ours understands our weakness, for he faced all the same testings that we do, yet he did not sin. Jesus is our high priest. He set the sinless example for us to follow. But that's not always easy. Not easy at all. Yet the season of Lent gives us an opportunity for new life. That 40 days, we can choose to give something up or we can choose, I have found that I like to find those 40 days and not so much depriving myself of things but in giving things giving giving to others trying to do trying to do for others oh we can deprive ourselves of things and we can boast about that we got through 40 days okay but we're going to go back to it. So many times we go right back. We gave it up for 40 days. And I'm not knocking that. If it's something that you want to give up, a lot of people give up sugar. A lot of people give up chocolate. Something that they really like a lot.
You have the Holy Spirit living within you that helps you. You have God's word that's able to help you fight this temptation. So there's no reason. We need to think about stop sinning. Our desire should be to stop sinning. Why should we want to stop sinning? Because we love Jesus. Because the Holy Spirit lives within us. Think about it. I thought about it this year in, a, in a, just a different way. Every time we sin, we're like the soldiers that are beating it and scourging Jesus. And every time we sin, it's like we are piercing Jesus. Every time we sin, we're like the soldiers that are driving the nails into Jesus to crucify him. We're not standing firm on our faith. We've been forgiven of our sins. He forgives us. So let us not fall into that trap of temptation, of sin. Because we love Jesus, we should strive to not sin, to not fall into that temptation, to run from that sin. And I mean to really put our track shoes on and run, and run from it. If you know something causes you to sin and fall into sin, don't go around it. Stay away from it. Satan wants nothing more than to destroy your witness for Jesus. No, we're not sinless. But we are forgiven. Praise God, we are forgiven. So let us strive to not sin. Let us strive during this season of Lent to remain free of sin as best we can. And let us think about what new life is coming and let us look forward to Easter morning. The glorious Easter morning in Jesus' resurrection and the celebration. You know, we should live out Easter morning every day. Every day because we are forgiven of our sins. And because of Jesus' resurrection and our living Savior, we are forgiven. Because he died for us and paid the sin, paid our sin debt in full. Washed away. Go. So let us strive to live our life in love with Jesus. And let us strive to use God's weapons, the word, and to use that armor in Ephesians to be able to fight off the temptation that we will endure in our lives. Remember Satan's looking for a time when you're weak, you're tired. We all get weak and we all get tired. So let's not let him throw us into a trap and trap us. Let's declare God is with us. Let's proclaim God's word and fight the temptations that are around us. Amen. Let us now continue our service of Holy Communion. You'll find that as an insert in your bulletin. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.
us, God, how grateful we are, Lord, that you love us and that you provide your abundance for us. Lord, we thank you that you provided Jesus Christ for us, that you provided our freedom from sin, that Jesus was victorious. And so, Lord, we thank you. We thank you in knowing that we are saved and that we are forgiven and that we receive your gift of eternal life. And Lord, let us now pray together the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Hey, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Please stand. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Hey, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Please partake. By your divine presence, by the holy sacraments, by all the merits of your life, suffering, death, and resurrection. Bless and comfort us, gracious Lord and God. Amen. In the same way, after supper, our Lord Jesus Christ, he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this whenever you drink this in remembrance of me. Teach me, Lord, to love you. My heart be open, your love is Our Lord Jesus Christ said, drink from this, all of you. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us all partake together. Christ, the Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Bring to us your peace. Amen. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Until he comes. comes.